where you can make decisions about your your own nutrition. Um, so I, it took it, it we took a, a long convoluted path to start thinking about food differently, uh, about food as having more than just nutritional value, but also food as um, something that um, that can serve as a convener, that can serve as a social lubricant, as an, as an, as an opportunity for creating relationships as a sign of respect and as a sign of, of welcoming people. And um, that happened when we started doing um, events in Northern Manhattan Parks, in which we were inviting people to come and for the sake of physical activity, to come to the park with us and celebrate the beautiful parks in Northern Manhattan where a lot of this work took place. And the moment we started talking about convening people in public spaces, food came up as a strategy for Feeling people, making people feel welcome, making people feel like they can connect with each other. Food has this capacity to just bring us together in ways that nothing else can. Some people may argue music can do that, but I would say food tastes better than music. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so, in, so a lot of our discussions around planning an event that was meant to activate public spaces was around food. Uh, because we had a lot to, of people to feed. And, um, so I'd like to, to build on that experience of thinking about, about food very differently and to then talk a little bit about um, new strategies for um, engaging civil society and um, thinking about how that engagement can inform policy and thinking about how that can help us address the obesity epidemic in ways that are, I think, more powerful and more effective than simply individual level behavioral change. Um, so when, you, when I think about civil society, I think about social movements, and I think about everybody having a stake in, um, in making changes that are going to help the, improve the life of the collective. Um, and for me, when I think about that type of engagement, I think about how can I create a um, broad base where a lot of people can find themselves having a stake in that um, shared work in benefit of the collective. Because absent of that broad base of engagement, you just have discrete groups of people that are trying really hard to advance a cause, but with not enough power to make a change. So I am going to tell you a little bit about my work at City Harvest um, in New York City. I am. Um, in, in full disclosure, and just in case there's New York uh, uh, colleagues in the audience, <laughs> I am talking about work, oh, back there, I'm talking about work that I have not been involved in since 2012, but the team that I worked back in 2012 has continued to do, so I am not taking credit for any of this, I'm here as a storyteller. Um, so uh, City Harvest is a food rescue organization that um, addresses says the problem of food insecurity in New York City, and interestingly enough, they thought of themselves simply as connecting people, uh, uh, food that was in excess in place A to people in need in place B, right? So that's how they thought of themselves originally. And then there was a moment in which the organization started to, um, like the evidence behind the connection between the type of food that people have access when they're food insecure and their health, uh, led them to think about themselves as something bigger than just thinking about putting food, any kind of food, in people's plates, right? Because it, the irony of people who are living in food insecurity circumstances is that the, the access that they have to food sometimes is not the best, right? It's whatever can be provided to them. Um, and then as a result, they have a higher burden of food-related diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease and obesity, etc. So at, at before my joining the organization, there was this, um, that the evidence was starting to um, weigh in, pun not intended, um, and the organization decided to create this uh, program uh, area called Healthy Neighborhoods, which brought together not only the food distribution um, arm of the enterprise, but that concentrated on neighborhoods where there was an overlap of poverty, food insecurity, um, and uh, diet-related diseases. 
And in doing so, they were reorganizing some of their programming so that um, they could uh, not only think about themselves as an organization that um, helps support food insecurity, but a, as an organization that is informed by the communities in which it is rolling out programming. So to get that started, there were um, opportunities for um, collecting input from the people that they served as a starting point, right? Because um, when you don't know where to go, you ask people. So they engaged in um, uh, asse uh, uh, assessments of the food environment and of the conditions that led people to make decisions about their food. Um, and then they started to go to the normal places where public health people usually go when they want to address uh, nutrition-related problems or diet-related diseases. They started to do interventions that targeted individual level behaviors. And so they did um, work in uh, Food access points, bodegas, and small grocery groceries in New York City, in five neighborhoods of New York City. They started to do nutritional education, and um, they they found that absent a larger mobilization of residents of those areas, they were just going to be spinning their wheels, and the impact for addressing uh, not only food insecurity but access to food in general uh, was not going to really have that much impact. And that's where, um, these are the neighborhoods in which they are. We have programming, this is North Manhattan, I used to live right here. This is the South Bronx, um, this is Northeast Queens, um, this is bed in Brooklyn, and this is the northern um, shore of Staten Island. Um, and, yes, absolutely. See, the thing is, I've been told that because I'm Puerto Rican, I'm really loud, so I try <laughs> to stay back from the mic so not affect people. All right, now can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay, so um, so, so part of the strategy that, that City Harvest had to add to their regular programming was um, building on networks of organizers in each one of the, of the county neighborhoods. Um, and follow their lead in what kinds of um, activities they should do to be able to not only address the immediate problem of food insecurity, insecurity but the larger problem of access to food, healthy food in those neighborhoods. So um, in, I'll give you examples from two of the five main healthy neighborhoods. In Bed-Stuy, um, there already existed a, um, a about 30 uh, gardens that produced food for their members, um, but they didn't exist as a network of um, uh, allied groups that worked together. Mm -hmm. So the Community Action Network was um, an opportunity for people to come together and build on their shared collective strengths so that they could advance food access um, at a much larger level than just individual level access to food. And um, so part of what the, um, the Community Action Network was able to do as a collective was that when, um, when there was a, a questioning of um, the healthiness of the food that they were growing because of um, potentially the threat of soil toxicity, they were able to come together as a network and, um, and set parameters around testing the level of soil toxicity in each one of the gardens, ensuring that they had uh, all of the uh, resources necessary to grow food in a safe way. Um, a lot of the lots where they were growing food had been um, places that had been abandoned and became empty lots. And although they had been really good about having raised beds, the general public's perception of the food that they were growing was that it's toxic. So because they were organized, they were able to stand their ground and defend the gardening movement in, um, in Brooklyn, in that side. The other uh, big collective win for the group was that um, as Mayor de Blasio was working to find where else can we put more people in New York City, where can we increase um, density, change zoning to increase density for, resi for residential uh, growth, uh, many of the gardens became threatened because here we have like 
empty lots that have food. Maybe we should have a building there. Um, so because the, um, the network was organized as a collective, they were able to mobilize, um, work with the elected officials, and halt and be part of the decision making around what areas of, the, of that site would be developed um, so that that wouldn't threaten the, the work of, uh, of the individual gardens that were producing food for their neighbors. The other example that I wanted to share, is, and here's a little bit about the things that the committee did. And this is the coverage of what they did. Um, so the other um, example that I wanted to give is about the group in Staten Island. And it, we're all familiar with the term food desert. Um, and um, in Staten Island, um, although it is a very different urban landscape than other parts of New York City, um, the, the, the particular problem in this area where the um, community action network for Staten Island was focusing on was that there were access points, but because there are the diversity of cultures and ethnicities is so big, um, people who would frequent a Mexican deli would not necessarily go to a halal place, would not necessarily go to an African cuisine place, and would not necessarily go to a Sri Lankan restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. So there were access points, and each one of these access points carried fresh produce from the different um, traditions and cultures of each one of their different groups. But if I am Latina, I may go here, but I may not necessarily feel comfortable going there. So the strategy that they used as a collective was um, um, getting to know the grocers and getting to know the types of food and the access points in a very different way by literally going in with people and having events across um, across ethnic groups, a my plate challenge in which people used recipes to highlight what a um, Sri Lankan my plate would look like, what a um, Guinean uh, my plate would look like using the, um, the USDA um, uh, recommendations for what a healthy food plate looks like. And by using that, um, that strategy, they were able to uh, increase people's um, level of comfort with going to grocers that were different than whatever their ethnic background was. Um, and finally, I just wanted to talk about um, work that I did um, when I moved to health philanthropy after my stint at City Harvest. Um, and because I want to make the point that um, philanthropy, health philanthropy also has a role to play in advancing um, work that doesn't necessarily focus exclusively in the individual level behavior change, but that creates the conditions for um, civil uh, engagement in improving the food landscape. Um, as a program officer at the New York State Health Foundation, I worked with um, six neighborhoods across New York State, um, and in each one of those areas, we focused on what are the um, food access issues that this neighborhood has, what are the um, issues related to the built environment that um, get in the way of people phys being physically active. Um, and in the area of food, one of my favorite projects was um, in the city of Syracuse, in which there is a supermarket that has been around next year, it's gonna be 100 years that the Jane Brothers supermarket has been there. And um, the uh, St. Joseph's Primary Care Center, which, sorry, we're laughing, right? Um, <laughs> where they share a parking lot, right? So here's the supermarket, and here's the, uh, the primary care center. And um, the, the, the project, what it did is that it used the, uh, the metaphor that they were both in the same space and sharing um, a parking lot to, um, to propose collaborations across the retail, the food retailer and the primary care access point that helped um, increase access to food in a way that was going to um, will be beneficial to the public and that it would be beneficial to health in a, in a non-traditional way. So um, the work that they did had um, a lot to do with thinking about what are the strategies that um, uh, retail has for um, directing the public towards 
one product versus another, and connecting the primary care nutrition team with um, the supermarket in a way that when when the um, when patients came into the clinic, they used the um, the circular of the supermarket as one strategy for discussing nutrition and discussing how are you going to change your um, eating habits so that you can be a healthier person, right? Um, but in the context of a neighborhood in which this is the only supermarket, this is the only food access point in, in all of the uh, west side of Syracuse, this also became an opportunity to talk about how do you build solidarity to improve the, uh, the food access in your neighborhood? How do you um, find opportunities to um, use your purchasing power to let the supermarket know what are the kinds of items that you want to see in the supermarket? So it became more than just an opportunity to have a discussion about your um, your individual level behavior and your decisions around around food, and it became a larger conversation about how do we improve the food access for all of the residents of the New York side. And I'm going to be more than happy to talk more about that project because it's one of my favorite. I don't know. All right. So the last point that I would like to make is that as public health people, sometimes we get hung up on um, what can we do at the level of the individual, but if we want to think about um, change that is really engaging um, civil society, we need to zoom out and, um, and find opportunities to impact the food landscape in ways that um, we cannot see when we are so close to, um, to the behaviors that we want to change. And just to to go back to the metaphor of looking behind the curtain, what we need to think about, I like to propose, is that we need to think about the entire global food system, not just about where, um, where are people making decisions around food at the level of the individual, but where are there opportunities in this system to improve health by thinking about the formulation of food, by thinking about um, the uh, our, our power as consumers in informing where, what kind of food items we want to have, in thinking about um, the, the, the people that are producing the food that we are eating, right? So if we can zoom out from obesity as being a problem of what you put in your mouth, we can find much better opportunities for um, addressing obesity than if we only focus on the individual level. And I've gotten my notice that. <laughs> I look forward to talking in more detail about this. Thank you. Sugar comes from those beverages. You know? And 
almost from this uh, you know, brand. Also, the PAHO uh, uh, results shows that we eat a lot of, of Utah processed foods, you know, packaged foods, uh, we're the first place in Latin America. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> uh, diabetes is the second leading cause of death with almost 1,000 um, deaths a year from now. No? That the, that's the, the data for 2015, so now we must be um, more than 100 deaths a year. And so uh, we have set some public um, policy objectives. No? We are proposing all that based on, a, on evidence to work on four uh, main policies. So first, uh, the marketing to children regulation, the fiscal policy, as a, uh, that means um, as, as big tax, uh, healthy food in school, and a food labeling, no? front of package labeling. And all these accompanied with a raised public awareness um, strategy. So to, to do that, we work on a partner synergy with, well, we are the advocacy organization, with public organization and academic researchers, mainly from the, Institute, the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. So our main objectives are to raise public awareness, as I said, regarding obesity causes and also the solutions and to build support for policy implementation or, by now, uh, strengthening. So how do we do that? This is our framework. And we have three essential campaign and advocacy steps. First is to expose the human drama so people can see them as a victim. And so it we people begin to have the interest. Then we identify the culprits so we can see the anime or the cause. And so we begin to feel angry. And third, to present the solutions now. So we can see a solution and then people can feel engaged. This is the uh, Chris Rose framework. So how do we do that in practice? Um, here's some of the main activities we have. So we create a strong collective voice. I'm going to talk to you how this is, has been reflected. We formulate public policy agenda, evidence-based, as I say, and we also want to know the public perceptions and because it will allow us to develop mass media campaigns, that's like some of our strength. strength. And we apply uh, earning, earned media strategies. We learn from the experts. We have that dialogues with the key actors and we try to systematize size and learn. So uh, in 2012, we created the Nutritional Health Alliance, a broad-based national movement, thematic civil society coalition, and we have a common agenda. So those organizations uh, are working on children's rights, for example, on agriculture, on water issues, and we, they all have their legitimacy and their expertise. So, um, to, for the first purpose, to expose the human drama, we began in 2012 with this campaign named First Came Obesity, Then Diabetes. We wanted to show the, the, the human drama of having diabetes in Mexico. So, how do we do that? We combine those strategies. No, the media campaign, we have some public action on, on specific days, for example, that was the uh, Dia de Muertos, no, the dead dead in Mexico. We were in front of the Ministry of Health and we put an, an altar no, dedicated to the more than 5,000 uh, people who died from diabetes during the past administration. And those, well, it, it got on the, on the journal, so we, we have our earning strategy. Earning um, then to identify the culprits, we, we have many campaigns. In 2012 was the 12 spoonfuls of sugar campaign. That was like the most, um, um, there was a, a very low campaign. 
and then well, we have uh, experts like Robert Lustig on forums. This was the second campaign after the 12 spoon, don't harm yourself drinking sugary drinks. And we began to show the solutions, no, to the alternatives to the sweet, sugar sweetened beverage. And then our last campaign was don't harm his heart, no, the, uh, aimed to the, to the parents. Um, and we complement all that with evidence-based documents uh, like this fact sheet. To present the solution, we also have uh, this on campaigns. The on 2013, uh, for example, was it for a healthier Mexico, where we wanted to show that with the, the revenue of the tax, it must be used on uh, white fountains, on school or on public spaces. So we also work with the legislators. For example, here's the senator on a press conference. We do some public out actions in front of governmental um, establishments. And, and we have the president uh -huh. and, <laughs> and the <laughs> minister for the relation. Yeah, no, but now, but now he was, he was the, the <coughs> finance minister at that time, so to make pressure on them. And where to present it, um, and what? Because all of what I, I have shown is to stigmatize the SSB for the tax, but we know that the tax is not the solution. No? We need a more comprehensive public policy versus obesity. And so that's why we also have a campaign about uh, regulating marketing to children, the healthy school in, in school. We have a, a project called myhealthyschool.org. So uh, the, we invite the community, the um, school community, to report uh, the schools that were not uh, being implementing the regulation. And uh, we want also a useful food labeling. Now we have the G GBA system, I'm gonna show you. And well, so that's just a little bit of what we have done for more than four years. And we have now some accomplishments. For example, in 2014, we had a, passed a national SSD tax. This tax has proven effectiveness, even if the industry has been working on saying that that's not true. So we have a reduction in 6% of the purchases of the, those beverage. On 2014, yesterday they released the results of 2015, it was 9% um, of reduction. And our national survey on 2015 showed us that 52% of the population state that they consume less soda. Now, even if <coughs> that is not so true, but it means that people began to know that they're having a, a change in behavior. No? And on February 2015, the Supreme Court confirmed the constitutionality of the tax because also the industry came to say that mm -hmm. it was unconstitutional. And we have an obligatory water fountains law that's in 2014. Um, it, it's not um, obligating the, the schools to, to have the water fountains, but it, it's like the, the background not to do it. So we're working on to be real. Um, we have a marketing through regulation um, passed on 2014, but it has a lot of lack. For example, here's the results of the Federal Institute of Telecommunication that told us that children watch the more TV between the, um, 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock at night. And the regulation just uh, is, is for 2.30 to 7.30 in the afternoon. So, it is, an, it is not covering the, the most uh, hours of TV. And also children, unfortunately, are watching more telenovelas and drama programs in Mexico, and they're <coughs> also not covered by, by the regulation. We have a front of package labeling, as I said, it's the GDA system that was promoted since 2010 by the, Mexico, by the food industry in Mexico. Um, this we asked the government who was the group that 
and work on the criteria for the front for the labeling and they told us that in their was no group so it all based on the on the industry criteria and that's why we have a reference value for added for, for sugars of 90 grams of sugars so these allow that a product uh, for example a, a cola uh, beverage uh, to to seem that it has less sugar than than it, it has, no? and we also have a school food policy. But as I said, in this um, website, we have received lots of reports you know, saying that there's still sweet sugar to the beverage, there's still uh, junk food um, sell in, in the school. So, and that's national. We, we have reports from all the countries. So what are the, the, the lessons? Um, I, I made a, a resume, but it has been a lot of works and a lot of actions, campaigns, and even lobbying. You know? Even if we are not the, the, the lobbying organization, we have been with the legislators. Um, what the, one of the main lessons is to reveal the conflict of interest mm -hmm. and also position policy free of industry influence. You know? That's something that I think is happening in all the world, but we have been able to expose it. This is, for example, a public action that we had on the lower house of the Congress last um, 2015, when the industry with lobbying tried to decrease the SSB tax, um, say for the beverage that has more, less than five grams uh, of sugar in 100 milliliters. No? So uh, we had this public action, then I will tell you what happened. And we made this report named A Hijacking Nation National Strategy to Combat Obesity and Diabetes. That we made a critique of the national strategy of obesity in Mexico and exposing that, no? all the, the conflict interest that is on, on the strategy and so and the regulations. And another lesson um, has been to position children's protection and having a quick response, like uh, I said before. These, for example, are the, all, all the those beverage that um, ha, has have more less than five grams and for 100 milliliters. And as we see, they are all uh, targeted to children. So when the industry came with that argument that no, the, those beverage need to have less tax because they have less sugar because they have sugar uh, substitutes. So we say no, that's, uh, that's uh, not protecting our child. No, even if they don't have sugar, they, they are creating the habit to the sugar to the flavor. So uh, la the, the day after we knew uh, by the lobbyist organization that the, the industry was lobbying um, themselves, we had a this press conference. You know, so we, we think that we successfully defend the, the children from, from this project. And well, that's all, but uh, this is more here we can, you can find more information about the organization and the health, uh, Nutrition and Health Alliance, but I, will, uh, I hope that we can speak a lot of more with your questions. I have a question for Ms. Espinosa. I'm curious how this program, uh, if you have comments about its impact in the various demographic groups, like in the indigenous isolated areas versus urban like Mexico City, uh, do you have any comments about the difference of demographics and, and the impact and success or lack thereof um, along those lines? Um, that's one of our limitations, no? for example, we are at Mexico City, but one of the, the 
Health Alliance organization works in Chiapas, for example. So yes, we're not being able to, to see what's the impact on the less or the more little uh, cities or, or populations, but um, for example, the, the SSB tax has been also um, measured on the low uh, economic level and it has the more impact on, on the consumption of, of, of SSB. So that's how we, we try no, to, to have uh, some data from the population because we know that more than uh, half of the population in Mexico lives in poverty conditions. So, but our work is concentrated on, on Mexico City. Um, I had a question for you both about poverty, um, because when uh, sugar sweetened beverage tax initiatives have happened unsuccessfully in the United States, uh, what has happened is that uh, there's, a, there's a move to say, well, we should probably tax, tax this because uh, it's causing so much public health harm, and the soda industry comes back and says, no, this is just a bunch of rich white people telling poor people what to do. Uh, and Every time that happens, that there's a story about race and class that's bundled up into what the soda, the soda industry pushes back with, uh, and the, the idea that uh, and, uh, I guess I'm, I'm caught by this because of a, one of one of your slides that's you know when, when you when you have what are the reasons why you don't have healthy food? Uh, the one with all the dots was because escalo, right? I mean, yeah, um, to, exactly. So if is there a, a, are there alliances between thinking about public health and raising wages or increasing people's access to money so that they can afford to be consumers of the right of, you know, the right kinds of food, of healthy food, as, a, as opposed to uh, stuff that is cheap but uh, ultimately harmful to health? Thank you for that question. Um, when I when I propose that we zoom out and put the, for like 30 seconds, the global food system page. Um, one of the impetus is to think about not only the context in which the purchasing happens, but the context in which people accrue purchasing power to be able to make those choices, right? So that um, if, if you think about strategies for addressing obesity, having um, a living wage employment is, could probably be more effective than just teaching five a day, you know, you should be doing five portions of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, and, but that means that we need to broaden who becomes a public health advocate, right? It cannot just be about people who are squarely um, identified as working to advance health. That means that you need to collaborate with people who are part of the movement, that you need to work with people who are part of the um, uh, anti-poverty movement, people that are working um, to uh, promote opportunities for education and, and, right? So it means that that's, it, that makes it more complicated, but that also means that you, that you um, gain more allies, more places to build a base for your for your movement, right? So, so the earlier point of building a broad base is that the more you problematize what's going on, the more opportunities you find to, for people to plug in into it. So, um, so that's what I would say is that, that um, you need to think beyond the um, individual behavior of purchasing. And there, there are uh, strategies that help, for example, increase the purchasing power of um, people who receive, in the United States, that receive the, um, the SNAP benefits, the Supplemental Nutrition something something <laughs> assistance program. <laughs> um, by um, doubling 
that dollar if you use it to purchase fruits and vegetables in farmers markets. So that's a baby step. It's good, but um, but beyond that is like how do you sustain that earn that the earning power so that you can have purchasing power that then you can apply to um, healthier options and and. Um, I just want to very quickly share the experience in New York when there was a proposal to cap the size of sweetened, sugar sweetened beverages um, because I think that is a story about like why, um, you know, <laughs> well meaning intentions that went wrong because there was no, the, no, no building of a broad base. Um, when under Mayor Bloomer's administration there was a proposal to um, cap the, the size that, um, that businesses could sell um, sugar sweetened beverages. So instead of putting a taxes, it was just like, if you want to have a big gulp, right? So like the cup that is like this big, um, you cannot buy it in New York, you need to buy something that is a little bit smaller. And if you want that much, then you have to buy two, right? So that was the, the rationale behind it. That if you limit the portion size, um, you can limit consumption. So, the city pushed for this as a strategy to reduce consumption of sugar sweetened beverages and they didn't engage the communities that were most affected. The food industry, specifically the soda industry, started to um, decorate all of their distribution vans with all sorts of uh, messaging around um, don't let Bloomberg <laughs> tell you um, what you should do or like how you should uh, don't, let, don't, don't let your personal um, agency be determined by Mayor Bloomberg. And they had this really cool poster with like a big gulp size soda in the shape of the Statue of Liberty. Um, so this idea that, that this was targeting your individual right to drink up was what drew a lot of the public opinion around why this was something that people didn't support. Um, because the city failed to go back to the communities that were most affected and build a base in support for this proposal that they were making. Yeah, I did mention that one of the, the things that we must do for this year is to um, guarantee that the revenues of the tax are used or are allocated on the water contents and on preventive programs. No? So um, we're been doing also lobbying. There's uh, initiatives on, on the Senate, on the Chamber of Deputies, in order to, to accomplish that. Because yes, if not, the, the tax will not work as is it um, projected. No? And also I want to say that di diabetes is now costing a lot to people and to the government. No? Uh, dial to have a dialysis now is um, bro um, uh, well, it, it, it got a lot to the families and also now to the health system. So this, um, I invite you to see our documental Dulce Agonia is now on YouTube and Vimeo. And that is a, a, how it is reflected on the most vulnerable population, no? the, the poorest and the rural people that now is suffering of how they are going to cost all the the, the external, externalities of, of, of the illness. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is actually pretty similar to Raj's, but um, I guess I'll start out by saying that I think healthy food is expensive, and it will always be expensive because of the labor content in sort of agricultural production and then food preparation. And so making healthy food accessible requires either a subsidy or changing the income distribution, which then in turn requires some kind of political coalition um, to put policies in place that actually change the income distribution in that way. And so the sort of point about um, sort of creating a strong collective voice I thought was really key. And a really big difference between the US and Mexico are the kinds of collective actors that exist. So um, in Mexico, you have mobilized peasant organizations and indigenous organizations, and in the US, we don't. And sort of our small farmer uh, sector disappeared. We have mostly consolidated agribusiness sector. 
uh, and then food, as you said, is sort of this new venue for political action and sort of new political identities that sort of is touching down both in Mexico and the U.S. Um, and there's a sort of a lot of imagination, but then there's this residue of all kinds of politics and all kinds of organizations. And so my question is sort of for both of you, what is the, is there explicit thinking about strategies for recombining the collective groups uh, around, I mean, I know, I know Mexico sort of you, you engaged with sugarcane farmers uh, as part of the coalition to get the, the sugar tax path, uh, passed. So you know, what about beyond that and sort of broader changes in the food system? Are there, are there thinking and discussion of that? So um, I wish I knew more about this area. Um, and I would actually like to pose the question back to experts in the room that could speak on this. What I, what I do know is that um, at the local level, there are um, coalitions that are that are making the link between the food system, the food production, and the people who are part of the food system. So the people that produce the food, the people that grow the food, the people that, that cook the food. Um, so there is movement towards um, increasing um, income levels at, within, within people who are employed or who are part of the machinery of the food system. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, so that, to me, that is a, a, a really good um, opportunity to start a conversation that can be expanded to other, um, I don't want to say anti-poverty, um, I want to say, what's the positive opposite of that, uh, towards um, uh, income building strategies, right? So um, poverty reduction or um, uh, Improvement in social economy status quo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what's your name? Yeah. Thank you, Rosie. Um, so right. So that that because if by force, if you start uh, if you start arguing for better paying jobs for people who work in the food industry, then you can extrapolate that to other industries. Um, at the, at, the, at the federal level, there are opportunities to make that case for um, how improvement in um, uh, anti-poverty, I hate using anti-poverty, so I just bear with me, um, in, in strategies that help people um, uh, in, improve their, uh, their economic prospects. Um, the, the, what I would say is that the, the case that has not been made yet is that by by making improvements, for example, in the in the minimum wage at the federal level, that that we can reap benefits in all sorts of systems, right? In the um, health care cost, right? In the even in the criminal justice system, in um, education, in uh, you know health related to poor housing conditions, because not people will be able to live in you know, they will not need to put up with substandard housing. There's, it's a, it's a, a ripple effect. But I think that um, our biggest problem right now with all sorts of um, initiatives to improve the economic standing of people is this idea that, um, that it's going to cost more to do that than the gains that we're going to have. But we need to start finding um, good health economists or just economists in general, that can help make that case that um, poverty reduction means improvement for everybody. I'm going to answer in Spanish and Pilar will translate. Um, in Mexico, eh, la, algunas de las asociaciones que mencioné tienen una agenda totalmente dedicada al campo y eh, ahora nosotros como organización eh, lo que yo mencionaba, ¿no? nos dedicamos a, un, a promover una política pública integral, pero es muy verdad que nos hemos basado solamente en medidas regulatorias eh, sanitarias y hemos dejado un poco de lado la base. ¿no? Es decir, eh, pues finalmente el sistema nos hemos dedicado más al consumo, a la regulación del consumo y del ambiente higiénico que, que hemos llamado, 
pero eh, dado la importancia que tiene eh, volver a voltear hacia abajo, por ejemplo, ahorita estamos constituyendo una iniciativa llamada Valor al Campesino, en la que pretendemos, eh, bueno, no solo acercar al pequeño productor con el consumidor, que es un poco nuestro, nuestro rol o en nuestro ámbito, sino también modificar la política pública. En México eh, se trabaja mucho más a nivel federal, ¿no? los, los estados, digo, como aquí son, son autónomos, pero eh, pues también hay una línea, eh, funciona todo mucho más a nivel federal. Entonces, eh, hemos, esto es algo que creo que mucho tiempo ni siquiera los nutriólogos lo han visto y por ende estamos eh, dando los primeros pasos. ¿no? Pero, por supuesto, eh, como mencionabas, hay ya muchas organizaciones, muchos grupos trabajando directamente con los pequeños productores, pero al mismo tiempo, pues, el, el sistema ¿no? o, o la demanda de productos ultraprocesados, pues, ha modificado la forma en que se producen los alimentos, como, como aquí, ¿no? Entonces, sí, sí es una batalla, porque mucho tiempo no se volvió a ver, el Tratado de Libre Comercio finalmente, pues, a nosotros nos afectó, no nos benefició en términos de que fue uno de, los, de las razones ¿no? de esta epidemia de, de obesidad. Eh, entonces, me parece que sí ya hay un movimiento que está volteando a ver que, pues, es una de las soluciones, no, no solamente lo que está ya a, a nivel de, de consumo, ¿no? O más, más arriba. <laughs> so I'll make a summary of what <laughs> So basically what they are trying to do at El Poder del Consumidor is well, work more with uh, organizations that are um, based uh, in the countryside and yes, they, they recognize that it, there's a need for comprehensive policy and that well, their niche or the, where they work most is with consumers you know, because they are a consumer advocacy organization. Uh, and they have an initiative, a new initiative called Value to Campesino. There, I don't think there's a translation for campesino because peasant doesn't really, um, it's not the same idea, but Value to the Campesino that is working with small producers uh, to get their products directly to the consumer no? and create this uh, um, awareness no? that, that, that they can work together. Uh, the other thing that Fiorella mentions is, is that public policy in Mexico really works at the federal level. No, it's very different from the U.S. No, that it is important to lobby Congress, national Congress, and it really is the most effective strategy because the public health policies work at federal level. Uh, and uh, the other thing that you mentioned is that well, nutritionists have have been changing, no, the, their way of thinking, no, to 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 see you know, how the, 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 the changes in the food system you know, and the more reliance on, on, reliance on ultra processed food uh, well, has changed how people view their own diets. You know, and this is something that, they, that needs to be addressed you know, because it's, it's a long term change. Uh, and finally, that as, uh, as Lourdes point, pointed out, you know, we, we, we need to zoom out. You know, and a way of zooming out is looking no, at, at, at how uh, other actors, no, for example, the interaction with the US and NAFTA has affected the food system in Mexico. No? And the, the, there have been many attacks lately no, about how NAFTA it's, uh, has been very, uh, not just to the US, no, and out of this narrative is that NAFTA was one of the reasons in the, in the
Addressing some of the things you said last night, Pilar, in terms of coming together with common values, this, this problem of this uh, crazy business of you know, all these different values in the world. Uh, you know, I dream of, of you know, we could, we could focus on uh, sugar and diabetes and whatever, but an ecology across curriculum and campuses of all human organizations and, you know, of course, especially schools, and begin to, you know, I mean, you could focus on the history of and the ecology of sugar, and, you know, it's, it's a very interesting story, right, of why we got to where we are with these soft drinks. Uh, but it just seems to me that uh, we need to have more advocacy and, and you know, a little bit more holistic uh, way of, you know, certainly on food and sugar and whatever, but ecology across the curriculum and across campuses, and it seems like that, that, that movement, you know, kind of fizzled out. We get, we get lost in all the, in, in terms of, you know, remember, I am just a little flea, and I don't know, maybe I'll know more and more about what's happening in that arena, but maybe it's just a comment, you know, kind of a rhetorical comment, and I've got everybody's eyes glazing open, because when I talk about this, you know, that's what happens, you know, and I even start calling it positively ethical applied community ecology across the curriculum, and then that just, you know, everybody you know, closes their eyes and goes to sleep. But anyway, just just, uh, just a point. You're not a small comment. flea. You're a big flea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lot bigger than I was uh, 20 years ago, that's for sure. Don't mess with my phone, huh? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> um, all right, so I really appreciate your comments because um, the, um, so I was using language of, of um, social movements, right? So building up broad base is sort of like how we talk about um, bringing different groups to have a shared value um, and bringing different groups that may not think of themselves as having um, a common cause, right? So um, it, it, the, it, the, the image of the ecology, I think, is very powerful because it's, it's more evident that there's a benefit for everybody in, within that ecology when there is, um, when there is a health, healthy ecosystem, right? Um, as opposed to a broad base in which it seems like you're just fighting for something, right? Or against um, What I will say is that when we, in public health, uh, attempt to create that broad base and make the ecology case, sometimes we get accused of being health imperialists. And as the daughter of a colony, I hate the idea of being an imperialist. Um, right? So we need to find what is it that's going to make you tick. No pun intended with the flea. <laughs> um, but what's going to make you say, yes, I think that we need to do something about poverty because it's going to help improve blah, 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 right? Or yes, I want to do something about health and I am a business person. I cannot hire people that are healthy enough to help this industry grow, so I'm going to do something about it, right? So there's, like, we can spin it in all sorts of ways. The, our challenge, as people who come from different disciplines, is finding that, that um, finding ourselves in that ecosystem, and how what I do in health is going to benefit you, you as a farmer, is going to benefit somebody else as a uh, civil rights person, is going to benefit somebody else who um, is an artist who is constrained by their constituency. They, they are so hung up on like human rights issues. Does that make sense? Like, it's just sure. finding that, that common ground. So thank you for your comment. So let me just, uh, uh, I just wanted to um, ask Arela to comment on something that uh, happened very recently in Mexico, and just to highlight the, well, the, the consequences, no, of the conflicts of interest and, uh, and the political situation in Mexico, no? and how it had affected not, ju not just uh, Perella's organization's work, but the National Institute of Public Health no? in Mexico. Uh, so I just, and this is a report that just came uh, uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago in the New York Times about uh, the 
well, the, the, the interference, no, that some of the, of the advocacy organizations were de dónde podría provenir el spyware, nos comentaba que solo se vende a gobiernos. Entonces, el gobierno de México, como ya lo, lo comenté, está pues muy vinculado, asociado, como le queramos llamar, a la industria de alimentos y bebidas. ¿no? Hay dos frentes eh, muy específicos que son con México eh, y, y la AMPRAC, son las dos asociaciones eh, donde se reúnen las principales industrias de bebidas y alimentos, entonces no podríamos asignarle a una sola persona o una sola institución en el gobierno, se habla de que podría ser eh, eh, la... no me acuerdo, bueno, era una institución en específico, pero no, no poder, podríamos mencionar o una persona o un cargo o, o una institución, pero, eh, bueno, esto sucedió en julio y agosto del año pasado. Eh, tardó porque eh, se hizo todo el análisis en Canadá. Fueron los, el investigador del Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública, Alejandro Calvillo, director del Poder del Consumidor, y Luis Encarnación, director de otra organización, miembro de la Alianza por la Salud Alimentaria, recibían eh, SMS, mensajes SMS, con mensajes bastante eh, llamativos, ¿no? que, que buscaban que ellos dieran clic en un link desde su teléfono para tener acceso total al teléfono, es decir, llamadas, incluso video. Eh, bueno, eso nos ha obligado eh, desde hace ya varios años a tener medidas de seguridad. De hecho, tenemos una organización que nos asesora en términos de seguridad digital. Sabíamos que era lo que podía pasar más no pensábamos que, que sucediera y menos desde el gobierno. Y bueno, finalmente hay varias pues, eh, tal vez no este fue una, una extensión y no vino de gobierno, sino o la industria de alguna manera se ha podido mover y, y conseguirlo a través de, de otra vía, ¿no? No podemos decirlo, pero pues lo que podemos decir es lo que se mencionaba ayer, ¿no? Que, que el meterse o afectar intereses, pues va a generar una respuesta. Entonces, eh, comentaba con mi compañero de Argentina, ¿no? Creo que en México lo que hemos logrado, más allá de si hay una regulación de publicidad o si hay en las escuelas sí o no alimentos, alimentos eh, sanos, es eh, advertir o exponer este rol que está teniendo la industria de bebidas alimentos hoy en día, y creemos que si sí, en la población pues ya está viendo una conciencia y esto sí puede impactar en los hábitos de compra y de consumo. Ok, so the, um, the different organizations that were affected uh, by the, that they found some strange spyware in their phone and the spyware uh, Organization of the City Lab, no, that does uh, Cities and Lab, sorry, sorry. Uh, Cities and Lab. That is an organization that works uh, for what is it? Digital advocacy, it would be mm -hmm. okay. More than digital, but... Okay, so uh, so the, their assessment uh, that took a, a couple of months, no, uh, was that this firework that was found in the phones of Luis Encarnacion. Uh, what is this organization? Uh, Fundación Mírete, Alejandro Calvillo, that is the executive director of the Poder del Consumidor, y Simón Barquera, that you can see here, the director of Nutrition Policy at Mexico's National Institute of Public Health, uh, that uh, this power was only available for purchase for governments. No? Uh, and uh, what they did receive uh, was a series of messages that were alarming uh, and that it prompted them to, to to click on a link no, that would give them access, that would give the person that put in the spyware access to their phone. 
they also received other kinds of messages, no? That the New York Times article uh, details, mm -hmm. and uh, the the as Fiorella was saying, the hypothesis, no, of, of of the of who was trying to um, basically make uh, the organizations nervous, no? It was some sort of warning, no? Mm, and since it's very hard to know who it was, they still there are several hypotheses that maybe the the industry got a hold of this spyware uh, and it didn't come from the government. We, the, there is not enough data, no, to pinpoint to who who was the the culprit, no. Uh, but what the the lesson of the incident is that. Uh, what Fiorena was saying is that the the once the, the this organization